Welcome to Valentine's Day in Iowa City. Uh, remember, there are only 40 more days till spring. And this is welcome to our second of the third, uh, three Second Sunday Forums, sponsored by Project Green and the Iowa City Public Library. I understand this is being taped or filmed, whatever we call it now, and, and broadcast live, she says. <laughs> so you can see it again if you feel like you'd like to uh, learn something over again. My name is Marilyn Gaffey. I'm part of the two people that co-chair, trying to get people to come for this event. My co-chair, Jan Carpenter, is enjoying the speeches of Florida right now. So uh, the fun part of this position is to get speakers that are interesting to us, and we hope they're of interest to you. So if you have any suggestions, I've received several last month, and that was very nice, so we'll put those on the list. Our speaker today is Mr. Jonathan Poulton, and I think 90% uh, of you seem to already know him. He has his own little uh, following here. So he is going to discuss his passion of daylilies, past, present, and future. He's a University of Iowa emeritus professor from the Department of Biology, I understand. And he's going to tell us about how he got in love with daylilies in 2006 in Wisconsin, I guess. Uh, I understand there's over 80,000 registered cultivars of daylilies, so don't feel bad if you only have a few in your yard, 80,000. And over the years, he's developed a collection of registered daylilies and created several thousand seedlings by hybridization. And you've only been at this for 10 years, so quite an accomplishment. I guess the Holy Grail, <laughs> the Holy Grail is a true blue cultivar, and that's what he will talk about today, too. We will have um, his presentation, then we'll do refreshments. You'll have a uh, question and answer period. That's what the little notes on your chair were for. And we have door prizes. Unfortunately, the girl that has the door prizes still has them at home because she can't get here. But she said to write your, if your name is drawn, she'll just deliver them to you here. And hopefully it won't be too far away. I know there's a gentleman here from West Branch. Maybe we'll make connections with him another way if he wins. Thank you for braving the weather, and I turn it over to Mr. Bolton. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, very much. <laughs> Good afternoon, one and all. Can you hear me now? Excellent. A week ago, you would not have been able to hear me. I had that bronchial sinus. I couldn't even talk across the kitchen. But my pharmacist is here, and he's taking <laughs> a, a lot of medication. I'm pleased to be with you. I, uh, thank you very much for the in, intro, yes. introduction and the invitation. I'm honored to talk to you about my uh, love of daylilies that's um, consumed my life the last 10 years. <laughs> so it's clear uh, from what I've said already, I'm not from Oskaloosa, Iowa. I come instead from this little town called Budley Salterton. And it's on the southwest coast of England, about 40 minutes from Plymouth, uh, from where the uh, Mayflower set sail in 1620, headed in this direction. I'd like to say it's famous for something, but I don't think it really is. I think our best chance is this, that it was the birthplace of Sir Walter Raleigh, who's shown here on the left. And in the 1580s, he attempted to uh, establish colonies in what would now be Virginia, uh, unfortunately unsuccessfully, for example, the Rowan, uh, Roanoke Island colony. Uh, it's rumored, but I don't know whether it's substantiated, that it was he who brought back tobacco and potatoes to the monarch at the time that was Queen Elizabeth I. So my passport out of this sleepy little village was uh, uh, a scholarship to go to Oxford to study biochemistry. And for me, that was great, because at high school, I love biology and I love chemistry, especially organic chemistry. You put the two together, you get biochemistry, the study of the chemistry of life. And for me, it was absolutely wonderful. And obviously, in an old university, this is actually New College. I would pass by New College as I headed to the biochemistry building every day. New College was founded in 1379, about 300 years after the first lectures were held at that university. So that was Oxford. Um, 
a wonderful place to be. Now the neat thing about life I've found, and maybe you've had this too, is that you can be just minding your own business and then suddenly you meet somebody who takes your life off in a completely different direction. You never know when this is gonna happen, but I'm going to tell you about three or four people who did that to me, and as a net result, I'm standing in front of you this afternoon <laughs> talking about my love affair with daylilies. I didn't always look like what I look like today. <laughs> this was back when I could grow hair, as many of us did back in the days of the Beatles. And obviously, I had already found what wine was all about here. This was Christmas of 1970. And I had one more semester to go for my biochemistry major. And by that time, I thought, oh, I'm going to be a clinical biochemist in a, in a hospital for the rest of my days, analyzing blood, sweat, and urine. I kind of got <laughs> thought this is the way it was going to be. I had a couple more courses to go, but I really didn't see any reprieve from this path of life. But there was this botany course. It was going to be taught by a professor from the botany department. Well, I was a biochemist. The botany department was over there. It was full of tweed-jacketed professors sticking dead plants into envelopes. And I thought, oh my, this can't be exciting at all. <laughs> and to make it worse, the name of the professor was Butt, B-U-T-T, -T, Butt, <laughs> Vernon Butt. That didn't help the cause either. Now, I wanted to show you a picture of Vernon Butt. So I went on Google Images and I put Vernon Butt. I got none of Vernon Butt, but I got a lot of something that I wouldn't want to show you on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon at the Iowa City Public Library. But Vernon Butt came on, came on board the next semester wearing a tweed jacket. He was a fantastic lecturer. He was the best one I had in the four years at Oxford. And he taught us about things that plants can do that animals cannot, photosynthesis, things like nitrogen fixation and so on. He had us enthralled. And one particular lecture was on pollination biology, on the strategies that plants use to attract pollination vectors, whether they be birds, butterflies, bees, whatever. And of course, important in that is color. And so he introduced us to the major classes of floral pigments. For example, carotenoids that confer yellow and orange. And then there's chlorophyll, of course, you know is green. And then there's what I call the king of pigments, the anthocyanins. And they span the, the visible spectrum from red through blue. I was enthralled. I thought this was fantastic. I loved his lectures. And by the end of the semester, I was signing up to do a PhD in his lab the next year. And three years later, I then moved on to Freiburg in, in West Germany, what used to be West Germany. And I actually worked with anthocyanins in a lab there. And then, um, one night, one day, the professor said, well, we need somebody to go out to dinner with a seminar speaker. And I'm going, oh, you mean me too? You know, I'm trying to find an excuse not to go. <laughs> oh, yes, we need somebody. You go, Jonathan. So Jonathan went, and I met Dr. Kahn, who was a very a world famous uh, biochemist. And by the end of dinner, he was inviting me to come to his lab. And so to cut a long story short, I then found myself at uh, University of California, Davis for a second postdoc, and then I came to Iowa uh, in 1979. I came for interview in that awful winter. Do you remember 78, 79? Yeah. I came with this coat from California that had these huge holes, you know, it didn't have a zip <laughs> up the front. I found out what wind chill was for the first time. <laughs> it was awful. Outside Hamburg Inn, I remember the snow was this high. But it was the warmth of the people and the opportunity to teach and do research in the botany department. And I came, and I loved it, and I stayed with the, with the university until 2010. So that's, uh, that's how I got to be here. So the next game changer turned out to be this lady. <laughs> this is my wife, Susie Schwager. You may know her. She's a nurse uh, with the school system. And we got married in uh, 1990, and before long we had two boys, Christopher and Matthew. 
now 20 and 24, also game changers. <laughs> now Susie would like to be here today, but she's headed home from Guatemala where she's been on a medical mission with a team that has been doing surgeries to repair cleft lip and palate syndrome. This is Luis who had his surgery this week. And uh, she'll be home on the quarter to five plane, oh so boy. I cannot stay long. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, she sends her best wishes. Are you getting the feedback all right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's go to day lilies. This happened in 2010, in 20, uh, 2006, excuse me. So we took the boys for a camping trip and we stayed out, uh, stayed out here, if I can find the right one, there we go. We stayed at Egg Harbor and those of you who have not been to Door County, I'd recommend it highly, it's a wonderful place. And one particular afternoon I said, okay, let's go over to a beach on the Lake Michigan side. Oh yeah, that would be fine, let's do that. And as luck would have it, Susie drove, I navigated. And as quite often happens when I navigate, we got totally lost. <laughs> and so somewhere around about this 57, we came to this crossroads, I still remember it vividly. And Susie stopped the car and she looked at me and she said, okay dear, is it left, right or straight? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> And just at that moment, I was saved, because out of the corner of my eye was this field of daylilies. Unbelievable. It wasn't the daylilies I was used to, the ones that go rampant in my back garden. You know, it wasn't those. It was things like this. I said, stop the car. We've got to go. We've got to see these. So she stopped the car. And the owner of these daylilies was there. A guy I later found out was Ron Mickelson. So he showed us around and I was like a kid in a candy store. It was absolutely wonderful. And he was a great salesman. So he was telling me about the virtues of daylilies. So here's a list. They're perennials, as you know, they're easy to grow. Any, if I can grow daylilies, you can grow daylilies. They tolerate the cold and drought. They're pretty disease resistant. I have a few stories there maybe wonderful diversity in terms of height and, and uh, size, shape and color. And they can bloom, uh, they generally bloom for about a two week period, anytime between mid-June and mid-August, depending on whether they're early, middle or late varieties, okay? So as you're well aware, um, the aerial portion here is referred to as a fan. And so what they'll do is they'll continue to make fans and after three or five years, I would recommend that you would uh, subdivide these fans up and give some to friends and neighbors. or put them out on the curbside and they'll be gone by dusk as I find. Um, but that's one way of increasing the numbers. A second way is this, it's these pr proliferations. And on the, on the flower, uh, on the stem here, the scape as we call it, you'll find these mini plants. <clears throat> and once the blooming is done, you can cut off these proliferations. I have a, a, another presentation if you'd like to see after the break. And you can plant these and so you can get clones of the parent plant. I call them cheap clones. <laughs> genetically identical to the parent plant. Proliferation. But there must be a shortcoming to daylilies. And he came, he came clean. And that is, of course, that they bloom only for a day, okay? They, uh, so the name hemerocallus comes from the Greek, meaning beauty for a day. So there are, um, most are diurnal. So they'll open in the early morning, they'll close again at nighttime. Some are nocturnal, that is they'll open late in the afternoon and then they'll stay open all night and then they'll close around lunchtime. And then there's some that are called extended that will go more than 16 hours open. But I deal mostly with, uh, with the, uh, the diurnal ones. So it's not really a problem because you might have a clump of daylilies and you might have five to 10 scapes. And on each of these scapes, you might have anything up to 40, 50 buds. Okay, so even though a single bloom only stays open, for one day, you have a show for about two weeks. I was sold. I bought about three of these. And as he was loading into the car, if he hadn't said one more sentence, I wouldn't be standing in front of you here this afternoon. 
But he'd say one more sentence. He said, but you know, Jonathan, I get most of these by hybridization. And I said, oh, really? Well, how easy is it to hybridize? He said, it's easy. Anybody can do it. Cross pretty with pretty and see what you get. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm teaching botany to 450 people in McBride. I should be able to do this, OK? So when I got home, I had a couple of daylilies still open. And this is one that's 60 years old now. And maybe you've seen this uh, around the place. This is a bicolor. So we have three. We have three petals here and three sepals here. And the petals are darker than the sepals. We refer to this as a bicolor. And I was attracted to this guy. And I use this both as the mom and as the dad in many crosses with some other rather nondescript daylilies that I had in the garden. No names. So how do you hybridize? How many of you have tried daylily hybridization? I'm the only one. Oh, all right. So I'll show you in one or two minutes. It's easy. Anybody can do it. All right. I'm, going to, I'm deciding that this guy on the left is going to be the dad, or it's going to provide the pollen. And we're going to fertilize the mum, this one here on the, on the right. OK, so I go out in the early morning. By that time, the answers have opened up to reveal the mature pollen ready to go. All right. So that has the, uh, the, the sperm inside the pollen. So I'll, I'll rip off one of these gently, and then I apply the, uh, the anther to, the, cut to, the, to the, the pistil here. Of course, this is the stigma that has some sticky fluid that allows the pollen to stick on. You know when you've applied enough pollen, when you can see, you can't see it too well here, but you'll see an orange color right there on the end of the style, on the stigma there. OK, so that's the act of pollination. You've done it easily. Now you have to wait. So what will happen during the daytime is the pollen grains will germinate, and tubes will grow down here through the style to reach the ovary that's set back here. If fertilization takes place, uh, if you come back, say, three to five days later, what you'll find is the flower will kind of gently fall off to reveal these pods. And inside the pods are the black shiny seeds. Now, to get from about here to here is about four to six weeks. And as soon as you start to see it crack open and you start to see the shiny seeds, don't wait for the wind to distribute them everywhere. Pick them up. That's the one. You want those, OK? And so I, I did the crosses, and I had all these seeds. And then I didn't know what to do with them. And I knew, of course, that uh, different species have different requirements for seed germination. So. Uh, I went on the internet to try to find out what I should do. Maybe they required a cold treatment or something. And I found just by chance that the next Saturday, there was a meeting of the Cedar Valley Iris and Daylily Society. This is a group of about 125 people focused around here. We have, for example, we had a meeting uh, yesterday down at the fairgrounds. But we hold many of our meetings here. And um, we're crazy about more crazy about daylilies than iris, I'll be honest with you. But it turned out the next Saturday they were going to have a, uh, a public sale up at uh, Monticello. So I went up there, I met these folks, and they took me under their wing. I got all the information I needed plus more. Now, this is a, um, an unashamed uh, commercial for civids, OK? <laughs> so this is a great society. We have sailed. Um, two public sales, one's um, May 7th in Muscatine and one's in Monticello, August 20th. We also have daylily tours and iris tours. We have six meetings a year. And then we have a fall banquet in November. This year it's going to be November 12th. And the president of the American Hemerocallis Society is coming to be our speaker. We're absolutely thrilled. That, is, that will be in Coralville at the Radisson. So. Where will it be? Uh, Coralville. Coralville? Yes, okay. at um, what's now called the Radisson. We're delighted to have her coming to talk to us. And we have a website, civids.org, where you can find out all about us and our activities. So, excuse me, I'm going to just um, rejuvenate my voice here. 
So I got all the information I needed and uh, they told me that these seeds required a cold treatment. So I popped them into the crisper in our, our kitchen, the refrigerator section of our, uh, the crisper section. And they need at least a month to six weeks. Uh, Susie is very um, uh, kind. She allows me to, to keep them there until uh, around about um, Black Friday, and that's when I start to sow them out. Uh, and, and my season got started again. So I keep them there for several months, actually, in the crisper section. And then I found I got seedlings galore, tons of them. I, more than I could ever imagine came up. It was a great success. Now here's the downside. These seedlings will grow and say, uh, after Memorial Day weekend, I will, I will plant these out. But then you have to wait two years until they bloom. They generally do not bloom the first year. Very lucky if you do. And so I waited my two years thinking, oh, these are going to be beauties. And then I found I got some like this. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my word, you know. But I also got some that like this. And I thought, well, those aren't bad for a first try. Really? Yeah. And you could, see that, um, you could see the parentage of Franz Howells in here. You can see the sort of bicolor um, nature to these. And I like bicolors, so I continued on with crossing them. And so two years further down the road, I was getting things like this. I thought, oh, this isn't bad. This is kind of fun. Now I was making, I was doing about 300 to 500 seedlings each year, and then having to wait two years until they bloomed to see if they were good or not. And we live in Alpine Drive, where our garden is about the size of a postage stamp. <laughs> So what was happening was my, uh, mixed, my, my mixed perennial beds became a monoculture of daylilies. <laughs> and I was growing, digging up the lawn and making new <laughs> beds. And soon there was a time when, uh, well, I remember it well. I said to Susie, hey, can I dig up this portion right there, the lawn right in the middle here? And she said, not with this wife you're not going to. <laughs> and so I knew that was the end of it. Okay. <laughs> But to my rescue came two good friends called Joe and Mary Joe Duffy, because this was the state, this is what it looked like at home. Oh you know, it was like this. Everywhere you looked, it was like this. <laughs> so anyhow, Mary Joe and Joe Duffy are great friends of ours. They live out on Newport Road, and they said, well, we have this extra vegetable garden we're not using. Would you like it? Oh, sure, I'd love it. So, <laughs> so I went ahead, and I moved out there, and... Um, I've been there ever since, and every year I go hat in hand to Joe and, and Mary Joe and say, well, would you mind if I, could I expand in <laughs> a little bit? And now I have about uh, 2,000 to 2,500 seedlings out there. Oh my goodness. Now the enemy, that, this is the enemy. Oh yeah. Oh dear, they are. But I've kept them out, and I've done this. When I, ha I have a solar generator here that is attached then to two lines. One's about this height and one's about this height. So chest and waist height, and they kept the deer out. We just kind of retrained them to go around this plot. They've never been in there in six years. And they've uh, been very lucky so far. So this is what it looks like in the summertime. I absolutely love it out there. You get away from the city noise and traffic. All you hear is the wind in the trees and the tweets of the larks, and you see these lilies just kind of waving in the breeze and you look around and you think these are all seedlings okay so and you look around and you think I and the creator have made these okay and it's absolutely wonderful and it's worth all the time that you spend at the physiotherapist <laughs> getting your back uh, um, checked out in the fall so I moved on and so 2012 I came to things like this and I was thinking, well, maybe I'm getting somewhere. This, this was a little bit more variety here. A spidery look. Here's obviously a bicolor. Here's a hint of blue down here. A nice triangular shape down here. And I thought, well, I'll bounce these off a friend that I met in a national meeting, a guy by the name of Lee Pickles. And I asked him, his feedback when I stand right there, right? Um, I asked him, I sent him an email, I said, Lee, would you give me some honest feedback on these lilies? Am I getting somewhere? 
And I waited anxiously for his email, and back it came, and I opened it up, and he didn't say, oh, these are the best I've ever seen, Jonathan, or, boy, you might as well forget about these. He, he didn't address it directly. All he said was, I'll give you the same advice <coughs> that my mentor gave me when I was starting to hybridize. And this is what he said. If you use old plants, in other words, cultivars that have been around for a long time, all you'll get will be old faces. So purchase a few of the best you can afford to begin and get a go ahead with that. But to sweeten the pot a little bit, he said, well, I have these extra seeds, Jonathan. Would you like them? I don't need them. You'd be crazy to turn down these <laughs> seeds. Okay? So two years later, here are some of his creations. <coughs> Excuse me. And you see ruffles. You see Piketty edges. You see eyes. You see watermarks. I'll talk about these later on. You see this fluted nature here. And just the, sub, you know, just the, the saturation of the colors, fantastic. Here's some more. Here are even a couple of doubles here. Can you see? It doesn't always show like that. The next day they'll be singles. But the best of all was this one. And I really like that one. So I continued on and did some more hybridizing. And I eventually uh, began to, I, I registered my first ones in 2014 um, after three important ladies in my life. And they, this is the first one. This is Bellevue Beauty. This is for my wife, Susie. Okay, I wanted to have sassy Susie, but somebody had already <laughs> taken oh. it. <clears throat> but she comes from Bellevue, and so it became Bellevue Beauty. And uh, it's very nice. The next one was called Yolanda Smile. This is a, a lady, I suspect up in her 70s, not in good health, um, that I've met. And she's from Mexico City. I speak about six words of Spanish, and she has six words of English. But when we meet, she gives me this huge grandmotherly hug, this beaming smile. And you know that although life is not easy for her, she still can give you this wonderful smile. So that's Yolanda's smile. Uh, and this is the, this is the uh, pollen donor, and this is the egg donor in this cross. So dad and mom. And the last one is Oxford Blue, which is my alma mater. So I registered these in 2014. And that time, when I looked in on the computer, there were 70, 75,000 daylilies already registered, 20, 75 hybrids. And it brings me to the question then, now of course, it's as of last night, it's 82,000. So it brought me to the question, where do all these daylilies come from? Are they native to North America? And the answer, of course, is no. Even though we have ditch lilies coming out our ears here, and you see ditch lilies in everybody's garden, <coughs> another lily is not native. They're native instead to temperate regions of the Far East, China, Japan, Korea. And there's an estimated 20 to 25 different species. And uh, the Chinese certainly have known about these for two two to 3,000 years. Used as food and medicine, not only as uh, garden ornamentals. And if you look at them, they tend to be anything from one foot to eight feet tall. You might have a single bloom on some of the species, up to 60 plus blooms per stalk, often trumpet shaped, not the flat faces that we see on our day lilies today. And the color variation is very limited, lemon yellow, orange, or reddish yellow, fulvous, like uh, the ditch lily. But most, there are very few exceptions, most of these will cross naturally to give you fertile hybrids. So two of these I'm sure you know. This is the lemon day lily, Hemerocallis flava, now known as Hemerocallis lilioasphodalis. And you can see the trumpet shape of the flowers. And this was the nemesis that I have in my garden. I said, I'm, try I'm trying to eradicate this from my garden, you know? Um, but while you're sleeping, it's creeping. It has those rhizomes <laughs> that get everywhere. 
So this is the ditch lily, outhouse lily, call it what you like. <laughs> and we know for certain that these two had reached Europe by 1576. How they came, we're not sure. It could be overland trade routes. It could have been by sea. <coughs> but these herbalists produced these woodcuts in 1576. They didn't call them hemerocallus at that time. The name actually came later, about 200 years later, when Linnaeus in Species Plantarum called it hemerocallus. And then others were to follow. Altissima, Citrina, this is nocturnal, so opens during the nighttime. 45 inches tall, so quite tall, and up to 60 buds per, per scape. And this is uh, showing where it's, you often find it on mountainsides, so it's probably natural habitat. So who was the first to hybridize daylilies? I'm pleased to say that it was an Englishman. <laughs> he was a schoolmaster, taught English during the daytime and hybrid, hybridized daylilies in his spare time. George Yelt, he was also an Oxford alum. So the first daylily uh, to be registered was in 1892. It was apricots. That was George Yelts. And a close friend of his, Amos Perry, was a nurseryman in England. He made a collection, and the two of them introduced hundreds into the 1930s. This is Margaret Perry, named for his wife. But they didn't stop there in, in Europe, obviously. Daylilies came on further. And they came in colonial times across the Atlantic. And then as settlers went west, they, of course, took them with them. And that's where, why we see those two in particular in gardens right across the North American continent. So I want you to tell you about two Midwesterners that promoted daylilies tremendously. Um, and the first one of these is Arlo Stout. Dr. Arlo Stout, who became known eventually as the father of the modern daylily. He grew up in Albion, Wisconsin. He was an avid naturalist as a youngster. And he noticed that the ditch lilies did not have seed pods. He never saw seed pods on those ditch lilies. And he wondered why. And he got the chance to find out when in uh, 1911, at the age of 35, he became the director of labs at the New York Botanical Garden. And first of all, he made a taxonomic key for hemerocallus so, so people could key them out, uh, the, the known varieties, the known species at that time. But he made an awful lot of crosses too, 50,000 crosses. I'm thinking, I make a lot of crosses, but <laughs> oh, he must have had an army of people or a very good back, I would say. <laughs> but he uh, ended up registering over 100 hybrids. He also was a very uh, noted publisher. And one of these is this book here, published in uh, 1934, reprinted in 86. This really was the state of the art as of 1934, because it described all the known species of daylilies at that time, plus the 175 hybrids that had been registered uh, at that point in time. So here are some of his uh, hybrids, and they were a good step forward in their day, especially this one, Theron, is the forerunner of red daylilies. And that wasn't easy to come by because you can see, in order to get to Theron, he started with four different species and he did eight different crosses to end up at this one. Mm -hmm. But that was a major step forward at that time to get the color close to red. Now, about the time that uh, he started the New York Botanical Garden, Henry Field in Shenandoah, Iowa, uh, founded the Henry Field Seed Company. And in order to uh, promote his wares, he set up a radio company, a radio station called KFNF. Does anybody, would anybody remember listening to that? 
it's quite a while to go, so I don't know. Anyhow, this is it down here, KFNF. The farmer's, farmer's friend, keep friendly, never frown. <laughs> and it wasn't he who was uh, the person that they were listening to, really. It turned out to be his sister. His sister um, had a daily garden club of the air show. And this is his sister, Helen Field Fisher. And so people would listen to the show and then they would send her letters, you know, I have trouble with my geraniums, you know, what, what should I be doing? She got overwhelmed with all this literature that the, in, she ended up organizing these, day, these robins to try to tackle all this uh, um, re responses. And one of the robins turned out to be for daylilies. And as the Second World War came to a close in uh, 1946, she was encouraged to co-host what was called Operation Hem Show in Shenandoah. So people were invited to come with cut, cut flowers, picnic hampers, and sleeping bags. And they came in hundreds. And they came from like seven or eight states, not just Iowans, but came from all over the place because she had such a good following as the flower lady. And the next day, they founded what was called the Midwest Hemerocallis Society. And that morphed within nine years into today's American Hemerocallis Society with over 6,000 members in 26 countries, 15 regions. Iowa, of course, is in region one. It should be, that's where this all started. So we're very proud of this connection to the biggest day lily society in the world. Annual Jews are only $25. Uh, I have some of the day lily journals that I receive four times a year. They're out here on the front desk if you would like to take a look at them. And this is the website. So a few years later, they were asked to become the International Day Lily Registry. So this is, the, this is the group with whom I registered my day lilies in 2014. So let's move on a little bit. Now there are 82,000 day lilies registered. Of, of these, about 40,000, about half of them are said to be diploid. By diploid, I mean they have 22 chromosomes in each vegetative cell. These chromosomes represent two complete sets, one coming from the pollen, one coming from the egg, one from the sperm, one from the egg. Okay, 22 chromosomes. Now, but if just with the exception of a couple, the species daylilies, those ones that started off in, in China and Korea, those two are diploid. So these 40,000 diploid daylilies are all derived directly by hybridization and selection from those species out in the Far East, okay? There, I mentioned an exception. One exception turns out to be this ditch lily. And that turns out to be triploid. It has three sets of chromosomes. It turns out to be sterile. It will not, that's what, that's what Arlo, Arlo Stout found out, that it's triploid and as a result, Although I think the pollen is good, it will not set pods on this. That and the related one is Quanzo. You know the double that you see all in, the, in the ditches too? That is also triploid. Okay, so I counted for half of the 80,000. The other, uh, 80, uh, the other 40,000 turn out to be what we call tetraploids. They have double the number of chromosomes. They have 44 chromosomes representing four complete sets. So where do these daylilies come from? There are no naturally known daylilies with 44 chromosomes that are, that are tetraploid. So these actually come from a process called conversion. I won't go into any detail here. I've never done it myself. I kind of shy away from this because colchicine is not the most pleasant compound to, to use. It comes from autumn crocus, but it was found uh, I think in the 1930s or even earlier that this can double up the number of chromosomes. So if you apply this to your daylily, a diploid daylily, what it does is affects the cell division. <coughs> you don't get normal cell division and you'll end up with, with cells that are tetraploid, okay? So they started to do this in 1947 
and people are still doing it today. They take choice daylilies, diploid daylilies, and they say, oh, I think I want to make this into a tetraploid for reasons I'll show you in just a moment. And so they go through the colchicine treatment to get the tet derivative, the tet version of the diploid uh, choice plant. So people started to do this, and once you've got tetraploid daylilies, you can then cross them. You cross tet with tet and dip with dip. You don't cross dip with tet, you'll get nothing. <laughs> and I found this out to my horror this summer. I got this one daylily and I thought it was tet and I was putting all this tet pollen onto it and I was using it as, a, as it was a tet. I got nothing, 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 nothing. And then after the end of the season, I went back to the computer. It was dip. <laughs> uh, so I, it was a year wasted, absolutely wasted. So you can... So, oh, let me just go first. So, bottom line is this. We have about 40,000 diploid ones. Those are ones that have been made by hybridization in the last 120 years. We have about 40,000 or so tetraploid daylilies, and, and then we have a few that we know are triploids, like the ditch lily. Why would we want to make tetraploids out of diploids? Here's a good reason. This is Fred Manning. This is the dip one. This is the Fred Manning Tet one after conversion. What you find is the Tet ones tend to have larger flowers. The colors tend to be more vibrant. The scapes are sturdier, so they do better against the elements. Uh, what else? They tend to be more vigorous, and certainly the flowers and the leaves have more substance. They're meaty. I'll call them meaty, all right? But the daylily folks would say they have more substance, all right? So they stand up against the elements better. So you can see why tetraploids became attractive to a lot of people, and that's why a lot of people now are using uh, tetraploids. All right. So if you were to ask 12 different people, daylily people, and you say, well, what, what are you excited about? Which daylilies do you like the most? What forms, what features, and so on? You'll get 12 different answers. So what I'm going to do is show you some of the variety, the diversity that's out there. And I'm going to start with some floral forms, and then I'll show you some features. And I bet you I'll get you ooing and ahhing in just a few moments. OK, so this is the simplest of all the forms. These are called singles. And let me just remind you, we have, we have four whorls in a flower. So the outermost whorl are the sepals, one, two, three. The next whorl in is going to be the petals. One, two, three. The next whorl in will be the six stamens. And right in the center there will be the pistil. So we have an ovary stigma style. All right? Now you can get a fuller form to this in a form that's called polymerous. That is where we get more than just three and three in the whorls of the petals or the sepals. So these are polymerous. Notice here, four petals, four sepals, eight stamens. It goes up here, eight stamens. Here, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. These are polymerous. They might not do this every day, but sometimes some of mine will, show, uh, will have a polymerous day, and then the next day they'll go back to normal again. No rhyme or reason to it. But the, stamen, the stamens will go up there, too, so there's 10 stamens in this case. Here's another way. These are doubles. So this is where you have your normal three petals and through three sepals, but you have extra petals. So in this one, which is called a hose in hose, you've got three extra petals here, one, two, three, above the normal petals, one, two, three, and the sepals are down underneath, called hose in hose. A little bit more complicated is this one. I love this one up here, because it's blue, you see a bit blue, yeah. But in, what you have here is petaloid tissue, it's like petal tissue attached to the stamens. So they call it petaloid tissue. And it gives you this fullness, it looks more like a, an aster maybe. Some people love doubles, I'm not so sure, to be honest. Sometimes I find them kind of messy, but some people love them. I do love spiders though. So here in the spiders, we have petals and sepals that are elongated, thin and elongated. And in order to be, high, uh, to be registered as a spider, the length to width must be four to one or greater. So this is Bali watercolor. This one is a beautiful one. This one is 14 inches across. Four, 
14 inches, not, not pulling it out, it's 14 inches across. And then there is something called unusual forms where you see, oh, I'm sorry, where you see on at least three petals or three sepals a pinching or twisting, quilling, curling, or, or a spoon-shaped nature to it. And here's some examples. So for example, here's quilling of these sepals, see? Here's pinching of the petals, one, two, three. Here's the pinching of the petals up here. And then they've got curling up here in this particular spot, uh, in this euphor. Amazing colors, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, how far we've come from those species day lilies. Mm -hmm. And now sculpted, this is the uh, latest rage. Are these where you have some three dimensionality about the petals. So there could be grooves in here or ridges or some extra petaloid tissue that is attached to the, the midrib that's sculpted. So those are the six forms of daylilies, and when you register your daylily, you have to say which form uh, your daylily belongs to. But now there are features, and the features are equally exciting. So an eye, I'm into eyes, and I'll show you some wonderful ones in just one moment. But Okay, an eye is where you have between the throat and the outside of the petal, you have a darker region. It might be the same color as the petal, but it could be a different one, a different color as in this case. So this is the eye, and it's extending also onto the sepals. But we're finding now that this need, need not be just a single color. You can get patterned eyes like this. And I think of surfing waves when I see these. They're like ripples coming out from the center. Unbelievable, and there's so much diversity to these. Let me just give you a glimpse. And here's one that's coming out. This is from Jamie Gossett. He's from Ohio. So you know this sort of thing would be, would be hardy up here. It's coming out in 2016. An unbelievable patterned eye here. You, you look at this and you think it can't be a daylily. You know? mm -hmm. And then there are watermarks. Now a watermark is different. This is where you have a lighter area in comparison to the rest of the petal. So there's the watermark, and there's the watermark in this case right there. They're very, very nice. And then there are ruffles. There are people who won't look at their daylily unless it has a ruffle. <laughs> to my mind, if you have too many ruffles, it reminds me of chicken fat, you know? I don't know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not a ruffle person, I'm an eye person, okay? But you can find ruffles that have kind of a single color, or here you're getting into double colors here around the edge and eye. And then there are teeth. Oh. People are getting into teeth and even into tentacles. Look at that, tentacles. Wow. And it, you only need somebody to make that quantum leap forward, and then there are lots of hybridizers that want to have that plant and they use that as the starting point for the next set of crosses to make the teeth or the ruffles bigger, better, and more colorful, and so on. Okay, I don't want to extend my welcome, but what I'm going to do is to talk about something that I personally am interested in, <laughs> and where are we headed next, and I'm hoping, ah, there it appears, <laughs> you see. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that one day, I'm, I'm hoping I'll live long enough to see a true blue daylily where the blue covers the entire petal and sepals. A lot of people are trying for this, and I hope we like it when we get it. You know, it's a, <laughs> yeah, lot, it's a like lot of work. So this part of the story starts around 1970. The Chicago hybridizer by the name of James Marsh registered prairie blue eyes and the optimistic description was lavender with near blue eye zone and green throat. Uh, I'm sorry, but I really don't see it, especially when you see something blue over there. It doesn't help its cause. Mm -hmm. But at that time, that was a real leap forward, okay? And now you step forward 25 years and you get things like this from Elizabeth Stalter and Jack Carpenter. 
I have both of these in my yard. I use them as mom and dad. Lavender Blue Baby uh, won the Stout Prize uh, around 2007, I think. So the top prize in daylily hybridizing. And if we go forward just about another 15 years, you get to things like this. And I have both of these in my garden and use them as mom and dad. And the colors are about true, about true. So this is from the Florida hybridizer. Uh, for these, this is from Guy Pierce. And if I might just step back a moment, this is really most of the color is in the eye. There might be a start of an edge, but it's mostly the eye. But in these cases, you have the color in the eye, but also in the edge. Look at the edge here. You've got three different colors in that edge here, one of which is the same as the eye. And from another uh, Florida hybridizer, Laddie Lambertson, they're beautiful. And the size of these are seven to eight inches across. So it's a good size, tetraploids, of course. And coming back um, to the north, this is Jamie Gossard from Ohio. And this is a beautiful one, a tet from 2014. So in 40 years, 45 years, we've gone from this to these. Can we make the next step? What would be the next step? What lies ahead? And certainly what lies ahead is to try to expand out the blue so it covers the entire petals and sepals. And I thought, well, I'll go to my colleagues in the botany, de in the biology department, and I'll knock on their door, and I'll get the answer straight from them. Their molecular biologists, they'll give me the answer, and I'll be ahead of everybody else as I make my crosses. So I don't mean to knock my colleagues. They gave me, uh, no, I'm not going to knock them. They gave me their time, but they didn't give me the answer. Uh, <laughs> so they came away and they said, we can't honestly give you the answer because we don't have that information. Think about it. I mean, what you're asking me to do, uh, what, what you're wanting to do, is expand this eye out so it covers the entire petal. But we don't know, you know, the cells here have the same genetic constitution as the cells there. They have the same genes, but why are we seeing color here and not there? There must be some molecular switch that says, okay, we're going to make pigment in these cells, guys, but we're not making cell, uh, we're not making pigment in those cells. What is the nature of the mechanism? And they said, we don't know, and we certainly don't know for daylily. And I came away ringing in my ears. They would say, well, maybe you'll get a lucky mutation, a lucky mutation and you can override that mechanism, that molecular mechanism that causes the pigment to be here, but not there. So I walked away and thought, all right. But here's one. This is, this is, uh, this is coming out this year from Guy Pierce down south. It's a tet, and notice now the eye has been expanded out, and so there's only a much smaller region that we need to pigment, and even the edge seems Pretty good, expand it out. So this might be one that people could use as mom or dad in that cause. Anyhow, back to 2012. So I followed Lee Pickle's advice and I went out and I, I put a second mortgage on our home <laughs> and I bought about a dozen daylilies that were the bluest known to the world. Most of them came from Florida, I'd have to tell you that. And I brought them home, the, um, and I, it was an early Christmas present. I planted them out in fall 2012, and I mulched them under about nine inches of straw. I found straw to be better than leaves that can pack down, so I put them under nine inches of straw in the most protected southern part of the house, part uh, by the garage, and hoped that it will come through the winter. And when they came through the winter and started... They all came through. I was delighted. And then they started to bloom, and I started to take pictures, and I thought, these aren't as blue as they appeared in the catalog, you know? <laughs> and I go, uh, well, and the trouble is sometimes your mind, you go in front of this day lily, and you think, oh, yes, that's really blue. But it's really it's your mind is making it blue, you know? Your mind is, is perverting you a little bit. 
And so I came up with a standard, because growing around my day lilies was this Asiatic day flower, I'm sure you have it in your yards. And so I would use that as my blue standard. This is the blue I would like to see in my day lilies, okay? So how well are those purchased day lilies? And so I would put it up against that, like this is from Ted Petit, Monday Morning Blues, does very well in my yard, it's come up every year, always a winner, but not the blue that I'm looking for. How about these? Mm -hmm. You know, we need to tweak the blue, okay? If we could somehow tweak the blue so it's more blue and then expand it out over the entire segment, that would be wonderful. So I went ahead and I made crosses. I crossed A with B and B with A and C with D and everything. I made all these crosses. And while I was doing that, the biochemist came back in me and I thought, well, I'm gonna go into the library and try and find out something about the chemistry in those plants that do show wonderfully blue coloration. For example, these gentians, viola, hydrangea. These are the, this is the blue we would love to see in our daylilies. What are they doing in terms of their biochemistry that is so special? And what I'm going to ask you to do is for the next couple of minutes is you're going to don your biochemistry hats. You're going to be honorary biochemists for a few moments. I won't get you in deep, but the take home message I hope will be clear. So I went back and I realized uh, just like Dr. Butt from Oxford had said, the blue is going to come from anthocyanins. And there are hundreds of known anthocyanins. They vary just uh, slightly in structure, but they're all based on three parental compounds called pelagonidin, cyanidin, and delphinidin. Okay? So pelagonidin, if you think of pelagonidin, pelagonidin in compounds, you think often more like an orangey color. Cyanidin, you'd be thinking the red roses that are sitting on my table ready for my wife to come home <laughs> at five o'clock today, all right? Red, red roses, red wine, so on. That's, uh, that's typical of cyanidin. And then delphinidin compounds tend to be uh, more purple or violet, okay? But as I went on into the literature, what I found was that you can get to those nice vibrant blues if you had either cyanidin or delphinidin compounds, but you needed just more than that. You just, uh, just the mere presence of the compounds was not sufficient. You needed a special environment in which these compounds were sitting. So let me explain. So where do we find these anthocyanins in the flower petals? We find them inside cells in membranous bags called vacuoles. So here's a single, let me try, all right, here's a single cell, all right? And this cell has this membranous bag, there's the vacuole with the anthocyanin pigment inside. It's taking up about 60% of that cell's volume. The color that that anthocyanin shows to you is determined by the acidity of the vacuole fluid. So if the vacuole is more acidic, it'll swing to the red. If it's more alkaline, it'll swing to the blue. All right, so let's give you a fine example. I can get compounds quite similar to what you see in red roses. I can make them go blue in this particular plant. Morning glory, you know the morning glory, heavenly blue? This actually has cyanidin based pigment. And the reason it's able to do that is that it swings the, the pH in the vacuole to the alkaline side. And this was a study that was uh, reported uh, about six years ago by a Japanese group. And what they did was to take a look at the color change from the tightly furled uh, flower to the fully open flower 24 hours later. Now, it is the same pigment here and here. There's no change in the pigment what changes is the pH in the vacuole. So here it's slightly acidic, and then in the 24 hour period it swings over a unit to 7.7, .7, so now we're slightly alkaline, and now those pigments will uh, show, you, show up as blue. And if you make cross sections through these, this you can see here's the, here are the, the cells 
the pigment are in the skin cells, if you like, of the, of the flowers. So pH is very important. If we could swing it to the, if we had a lucky mutation that would swing us a little bit to the alkaline side, I could even get a red pigment to go blue in my day lily. Right. Here's another one. You know about hydrangeas. So this is a great example where we have complex formation between anthocyanins in a pigment uh, and a metal. Could be magnesium, could be iron, could be, in British English, aluminium, okay? So hydrangea is a fine example where we have a pigmentation between aluminium, aluminum, plus, um, plus an anthocyanin. I'm doing one more. This is, in some species, we have what are called super complexes. So this is where we have anthocyanins binding with some colorless flavonoid compounds called flavones and then metal ions in a ratio six to six to two, and it gives you this metalloanthocyanin, we'll call it a super complex for short. And it's these complexes that give rise to the blue mm -hmm. in the Himalayan poppy and in cornflower. Okay, so there are these three means that I, we can find in the literature by which we, we can get to blue in these particular species. But what, what's going on in daylily? So the only study that's been done in daylilies is now 40 years old. It was a PhD thesis done in Florida by Catherine Bisset, and she took I think it's about 20 daylily species. What she found was they had cyanidin and delphinidin derivatives. But that alone is not good enough to get us to blue, and indeed her, her, the varieties she looked at were not blue. But imagine, you can now do the same sort of experiments with this guy. And this is Rhapsody in Blue from Bob Faulkner. You know, there are very few times that I want to come out of retirement. <laughs> Probably only once, and it, it has to do with this. I would love to have my lab open again, that I would do the experiments to find out where is the blue coming from in today's blue day lilies. You know? So this is what I would do. So I would take little bits of tissue from here along this transect, little bits here, 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 and here, and then I'd analyze for the anthocyanins and some of these other pigments, the vacuola pH, metal ions, you can do this now in single cells. I mean, the technology is absolutely fantastic. And you could find out where this blue is coming from. And once you have that information, that might well help you with some of your crossing. All right, you've all passed. There's no test to get a cookie. All right, you've all passed. And now let's move on. So back to my crosses. So I did all these crosses. I ended up with 660 seedlings that year, <laughs> and I planted them all out, and uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty disappointed in what I got, because I thought all of these would be startlingly blue. Th here are the ones that I got. I mean, they're nice, but they're no further forward than anybody else has got. I'm hoping that this year it might be better. But here are some, and also, you know, ruffles and eyes and edges. Some blues, but no, no better than any other that are out there. This was probably one of the best. A nice edge on this one. This guy here, I only had one seed from this cross, and I was thinking, ah, oh, let's not bother to even plant it. I'm glad I planted it. Mm -hmm. It's really the nicest one. And the only one that I did register in 2015 is this one. It stands 48 inches tall. It, I don't even have to bend over to take the pictures for this. It's a wonderful one. Uh, it's a diploid, amazingly. It has wonderful branching. Look at the branching on this. And then it has these flowers. I think they're about five inches across with a hint of blue. I call it triple bogey <laughs> after the uh, stepfather, Mary, Mary Jo Duffy. Uh, and he's into golf, and <laughs> he suggested this. So that's where I got to. I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping this year, I'll have about 500 that will bloom this year for the first time. Maybe I'll have better luck, but we'll see. Anyhow, this is the end. <laughs> um, and, and you'll go out many mornings, and they'll be just sitting there waiting for an insect to alight, I'm presuming, and they'll sit there, 
And uh, this guy was there for an hour or so, would take pictures, he really didn't mind at all. If you're interested to see this, I will post this uh, on, on, uh, on our CIVIDS website, but it won't be until tomorrow night. And here's the bottom line. Try your hand at hybridizing. If I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Just cross pretty with pretty, see what you get, and you can have fun. But you'll need to wait two years until they bloom. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. Oh, I really appreciate you. it. Not everybody is going to put a second mortgage on their house, you know. Where could we buy last year's model more affordably? Uh, last year's model. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the observation is correct. Uh, I have even seen for 2016s uh, like $250 a single fan. I mean, and, and more and more hybridizers seem to be going from double fans to single fans, yet the prices seem, seem to be elevated. So, um, I can't afford that sort of money. Um, now, to the answer to your question. They do come down with time. Um, the civids, um, may I just borrow that a moment? Um, thank you very much. So, I belong to this group, civids, Cedar Valley Iris and Daylily Society. We have a couple of public sales each year uh, in, the, in the district. And this is a place where you can get reasonably priced daylilies that you know are going to be hardy here, okay? So when I, when I order from Florida, I'm off, usually doing that because it, they have the bluest faces, you know? But I'm also taking a chance that they will not be northern hardy. Mm -hmm. And so my advice to you is, don't go south unless you really want something. And if you do go south for your order, be very careful that it, they don't bring daylily rust back to you, all right? Now, daylily, uh, I'll talk about daylily rust in just a moment. I have a horror story I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> so I would try to go locally, like, like the Cedar Valley Iris and Daylily Society sales. Um, where else? There are... I brought some handouts. On the handouts, there are lists of some addresses, email, um, websites of some local hybridizers. I would start there. That would be the place to go. Likewise, they're going to be hardy because they've been there um, and growing in their gardens for some time. Um, now, are you ready for the daylily horror story? Okay. Sure. So I went down. The, uh, the young lady and, and, and man here is my niece and nephew. They got married in Florida two years ago. And while I was down there, I thought, oh, I'm going to go to the Daylily Gardens in Florida. And I picked this particular one. I won't tell you who it is. But they're known for patterned Daylily eyes, those patterned eyes. And I just wanted to get some of that gene pool into my crosses. So I went there, spent a wonderful day, they hosted me, and I bought three of these. And by the time I had got back to Iowa, they were sitting ready on my doorstep. They'd come up by UPS. So there were a couple of spots just in front of my uh, front door. I thought, oh, those are protected. That'll be ideal. I'll plant them right in there. And I didn't quarantine them. I didn't do any treatment because I'd never seen rust in my garden before. And you know, I'd had things from down south. Why bother? So about two weeks later, I started to see all these orange spots, these pustules. And I thought, oh, this is something different. On the leaves. Uh, often on the underside, but then they were on both sides, and then they were on the scapes, on the flower stalks too. And it didn't take me long to go on the website and find, well, this is daylily rust, and it's common down there. They spray for daylily rust on a regular basis, okay? But when you bring them north of the border, you must quarantine and put them in a part of your garden where, you know, there's very little traffic. They're away from anything else that you value, and keep an eye out for rust. And if you see rust, you need to cut back the infected 
proportions. Um, so if you take a fan, you'll cut back most of the outer leaves down to, right down to the crown, okay? And then the innermost leaves, maybe only that, so you just got this little nubbins of stem left. That's all. It's heartbreaking to do that, but you've got to do that because you've got all these rust spores everywhere. Well, I tried that and I tried spraying and, and in order to get rid of the rust, you really need a contact spray, but you also need a systemic spray because you may well have internal infections that the contact spray will not get to. So I tried that too and it didn't work. And by the end of the season, oh, it was a horrible season because every time I would leave my garden and go north of town to the Duffy's I didn't want to infect the 2,000 lilies north of there, so I, I'd get out of my clothes, take off shoes and socks and everything, and then I would go out there, and when I came back, change clothes again, you know, you're always worried. But by the end of the season, it had gone all the way around my garden, either wind or animals, or I didn't have any visitors. I couldn't have visitors that year. I didn't open my garden because I didn't want them, A, tracking it around, mm -hmm. but B, taking it home to their own gardens, mm -hmm. you know? And the good, the good thing was it didn't go north of town because I took special precautions. I never saw it north of town. Mm -hmm. And then the following winter, the rust will die. We're lucky. Up, we don't see it up here because it, the, the, the winter kills it, mm -hmm. okay? But down south, they don't have the possibility of winter kill, and so they have to spray to keep it under control. So rust is, uh, is worrisome. So I now will... I will not buy from down south I, unless I'm very, very tempted in the future, <laughs> very tempted at one that's almost blue and ready yeah, to go, say, and I've got to have one that's that almost one. Blue, yeah. You that's, know, yeah. that's my, but otherwise, <laughs> no. I mean, Jamie Gossett in Ohio has some wonderful things. You go to, I think it's Heavenly Gardens, but anyway, Jamie Gossard, G-O-S-S-A-R-D, he has things like you would never believe a day lilies. You've got to see his website. It's unbelievable. He's way ahead of the game. <laughs> and all of these are northern hardy. Great. Oh, do, do you have a question? Yes. Hi, Jennifer. I may have missed this because when it got very uh, scientific, it was uh, my mind was shut off. But ah. do you? Uh, do you? My students had the same <laughs> problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Did you amend your story at all? Um, did you all hear a question? It was, yeah. do you amend your soil amend at your all? Soil. You know, when you have such a large plot, you can't do very much, A, because of um, physical constraints, but also it can be expensive if you want to mulch it over or something like that. Uh, I will dig the soil well before I put them in. And when I dig, this, see if I, if I have a clump, or right? if I have a clump, I'll dig the hole to slightly larger than the size of the clump. And then I'll put in, I put in a fertilizer, although the books may say don't bother until late. I, I often use melorganite, you know, you know melorganite yeah. that you can get from Lenox and Sealix. And that's really uh, very easy to use. And I put a little of that in the hole, fill, the, you know, fill in around the plant and maybe a, a scatter of melorganite around the outside. And then during the season, once again, it's a sort of cost, but I might do melorganite, I kind of broadcast it out twice, uh, twice during the season. A friend of mine uses miracle Grow, yes. which he uses a couple of times and works well. Um, I think you could talk to lots of day lily people. They all have their special way of doing that too. But um, I never had my soil tested. I mean, what am I going to do if the Duffy plot <laughs> is slightly out? You know, I'm not going to be able to amend it. Uh, yes? Have you ever uh, put your daylilies in a salad? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I have. I have. Yes, tell us. And it's shiny. It, I do think it shows that because clover duffies are coming through and it's supposed to be really high and, uh, you know, like the dish di dish tray. They're everywhere. Why not? <laughs> it's supposed to be high in vitamin E at their plot. Let's see, yes. Do they taste like chicken? No. <laughs> 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 they taste like chicken. They taste kind of herbally, but oh. I just, yeah, I, I, I've been with it. <laughs> I, I'm 
I have these recipe books at home, and, and they also say uh, gala lilies are in sweet and sour soup and mushu pork. Oh, okay. um, but they had all sorts of um, uh, recipes. I haven't tried a single one. I know they do hosta lilies. They eat hosta yeah. lilies too. They do. It, it's it's probably the blue them. ones that are the tastiest. <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 yeah. oh, oh, another question? Oh, rust. 10% bleach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bleach. Bleach. Overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question up here was any cultivars that last longer, like a staining power in blooming, I assume, is probably what they mean. Well, you know, you see the Stella around town, Stella yes. de Oro, you know. And, that's, and she blooms that's, twice? Is that it's a re blooming yeah. one, so mm -hmm. it blooms, seems like constantly from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Um, and derivatives of that, I mean, uh, is, what's it called? Happy families or whatever the yellow one's called. Um, no, I really can't give you a good answer to that. Um, I haven't noticed that any of the parental ones that I have bloom any longer than average. So. Do the seeds of hybridized plants stay true if planted? The seeds of, of hybridized plants stay true if they're planted. Yeah. Okay, let me let me back up. I'm not quite sure where this one's going. When I make a cr Oh, please. So if you hybridize that plant and then you've got this gorgeous looking plant that you have. Yes. No, no, no. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. If I take uh, two plants and I cross them and I get seeds, every single seed out of that pod from that plant will be different from each other and will be different from the mother and the father. So it's rather like humans, right? Okay. You, you will, you're hoping to, to get certain um, aspects of the mom and the aspects of the dad and put them together to get this magical product, okay? But you can never be sure. But every seed is gonna be different from itself and from the parents. Now, um, the only way you can stay true is, is so you got your, your, um, your, your daughter plant, you want to make more of that. If you were to engage in any more cross-pollinations, any more sexual reproduction, you mix up the genes again, and so it's not going to go true. The only way you can go true is to let the thing divide, make up more fans, and then split the fans, so asexually, or proliferations. Do you remember I told you about the little plant, mm -hmm. plantlets? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a... Mm -hmm. Did you have any further find out which do you all remember what he's talking about that mm -hmm. little yeah, yeah. I, you don't have to yeah all right yeah we anyhow we were paying attention so in essence if you've got this little plant lit on the stem mm -hmm. okay so say it's sticking out like so what i would do is is cut it a couple of inches below and a couple of inches above maybe three inches above and then i stick that into the soil down to soil level around soil level and then it will root on down and give you a new plant within mm -hmm. weeks. What would happen if you do surprise and that same stem and that same flower on the cry itself? Would you see it? Yeah, every time you, every time you make pollen or make eggs in a, you know, to undertake sexual reproduction, you're mixing the genes again. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm not... Give me, give me the scenario again. Well, you have your favorite one, your very best one. Right. Can you do it to itself by taking pollen from the same flower? Right. Oh. oh, self it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Selfie. Yes. <laughs> self it. Yes. You can. You can. Yes and no is the answer. Um, so you can do it physically. What What's going to happen? It may or may not set seeds. 
sometimes they are self-incompatible and so they will not do that. <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, if you were to do that, because you are making new, new pollen and new eggs, you're undergoing the same genetic process that mixes up the genes. And so you will not get, it will not go through. Mm. Okay, the next question was when you cross, how do you track which stock is <laughs> cross-pollinated? Oh, that's a good one. Okay, so I have this mother plant that I really like and I want to cross this mother plant with lots of dads, all right? So one day, uh, I'll have to say one flower comes open, and I'll say, all right, I'll take the pollen from dad A. I'm gonna pollinate this flower. And, and then I've got to have some way of marking this flower, because what's gonna happen within 24 hours, it's gonna go like this, you know, and if you're lucky, we'll eventually become a, a pod. But you need to mark it in some way. What I use is green twisty tie that I get from True Value. And so I will twist around the flower stalk. The first time I'll just twist it around a small bit. It's what I call a no knot, all right? So imagine the next day, this one's dead. So the next day, another flower comes and I'm gonna cross him with, with, with dad B. So I cross this one and now I will put a knot, I'll put a tie around this one, but it has one knot on it, okay? <laughs> and so as I go on with the crosses, I'll have two knots, three knots, four knots, okay. five knots, squares, triangles, two triangles. And so I might, by the end of the, this poor plant's uh, summer, it may well have 15 crosses with 15 pods. And the only way I tell them apart is the number of knots or whatever on the green twisty ties. Other people go with hanging uh, white um, cardboard tags. Sometimes these bleach, sometimes, you know, wind, wind rips them off mm -hmm. and all of such. Okay. I go with the green thing, but you've got to have a book bookkeeping system. Yes. So I have this, and thing. in my book it'll say no, not. Oh yes, that was that was <laughs> Dad A. All right. Yeah. And the other question he had: Can you determine um, DIP from parent? Oh yes. Uh, uh, or can, do you need parent? Can, can you tell a dip from a tip just by looking at it? Uh, not. <laughs> Obviously not, because I've made a mistake this summer, but um, uh, dips tend to be daintier than tets, but there's overlap in the middle, and sometimes you'll be surprised what you think is a tet actually is a dip. The only way you can tell is, is actually, I think, to look at the pollen size, and the pollen size of tets is, is significantly larger than dips, so that's the easy way of doing it. You can go into more molecular methods, which are outside, you know, outside our, our bailiwick. But no, I go to the website. The AHS website has, it has a database, and you just go there, and it'll tell you all you want to know about the 82,000 <laughs> that are hybridized. The more recent ones have pictures, so you get an idea of what they look like. But it'll tell you right away whether it's a dip or tet, or whether it blooms early, late, middle, you know, this sort of mm. thing. Next one was, curios curiously, modern day lilies begin to resemble irises. Are you interested in a blue iris? I'd, I'd love to see one. Um, um, yes, I don't have room or time or back power to do irises <laughs> as well as day lilies, but awesome. yes, it would be nice. Are any of your hybrids for sale? Um, no, I actually, it's... Um, I, I don't make money on this at all. Um, it's rather like a money pit, and I pour <laughs> money. You spend money, but you don't make money. I am encouraged to sell them, but I don't do that because it's, it's more work. Mm -hmm. um, I only have a limited number of the ones that have been registered, mm -hmm. so I have to wait a while until, mm -hmm. and then let me know if you're interested to have them. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, okay. I, I'm not in the business of selling mm -hmm. them, but I, I tend to give hundreds away. Mm -hmm. um, Have you tried just putting aluminum on purple Stella soil? I'm not sure what that means. Or maybe aluminum to make it um, oh, fertilized? I see. Oh, yes, got it, yes. Okay. To try to make them blue. 
Uh, that has been tried and it has, tinkering with the soil will not make daylilies any bluer. Oh. It turns out it works for hydrangeas, hydrangeas but it does yes. not work for daylilies. Um, okay. How do you do, oh, excuse me. Please, no, please okay. go ahead. Um, how do you do with all the two-year-old plants you don't keep for f further breeding? Oh, and then it says, do you sell them? So we, you've already I, said I, I throw them away. I give them to friends and family. I think there may be several people here that might have kindly taken them. Can we be your friends and family? <laughs> <laughs> kindly, <laughs> kindly. Sign up for his friends Just and family list. Just let me know. know. Contact me in the springtime. Mm -hmm. And um, I live on Alpine Drive, so there's, <laughs> you're welcome. And, and you would help me if, if I could... Um, find new homes for these. I just don't like to tip them out. I will throw away the ones that are ugly, I promise you that. Oh. Those, those are thrown away. But then what happens to the others that are not going in quite in the right direction? So last fall, I, I dug 450 clumps uh -huh. from the lilies out at um, yeah. Duffy's, and they all went to another home somewhere. And then I filled 450 holes with 200, 2,000 pounds of topsoil. Oh my goodness. Uh, how do you even have a bag? I don't know. <laughs> and this one says uh, sort of the similar question. Have you experimented with altering the pH of the soil and influence the blue color? Blueberry supplement is our natural Iowa soil is basic. It's kind of back to what we... No, I, I, I'm not sure that's going to work, unfortunately. I think that's been tried. And Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor. Well, you know and I know that tissue culture has a problem. I mean, there are a lot of daylilies that are hybridized through tissue culture. Um, a lot of hostas. Too. A lot of hostas, mm -hmm. but the problem is you get a, they don't always stay true. You get what's called somaclonal variation in the, in the plants that are derived from the tissue culture. And so they may not be true. Um, so no, that's not a way to go. You, if there are changes in the genome, and yeah. no, I think it's. The thing with, with Florida is that they can get bloom. It's great for hybridizing down there because they've got, the, the lilies don't get killed off in the wintertime. So they'll go to bloom in one, in one season, whereas we have to wait two, you know. So a lot of hybridizers down there in central Florida, boy, they make hay while the sun shines, they sure do. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank very you very fun. much. Very great. Thank you for coming and a safe trip home. Yes. Uh,